God's people said. Amen. Amen. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious, oh, glorious day. Perhaps today. Wouldn't that be wonderful? He came back while we were at worship, while we were singing his praises, while we're involved in the study of his word, while we're meditating upon what he did when he came to earth to die for our sins. You know, hardly a Christmas goes by that we don't read out of Isaiah chapter 9. We've read it already this morning. We read passages from it this evening as well. Tonight I want to share some thoughts with you that I picked up and sort of mingled with my own thoughts from a man by the name of Kenyon Kirtan. I'm sort of putting together a sermon that he preached and some insights I believe that God has given to me from the scripture. As we look at the Word of God and as we hear the great Christmas music and particular Handel's Messiah and I know you've all heard that I hope you listen to it over this Christmas season it is scripture text set to glorious music that truly brings glory to God. We recognize the Hallelujah Chorus, right? But you know the chorus that I think is more glorious even than the Hallelujah Chorus is Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 where my text comes from tonight. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this there is coming a day when the second half of this passage which we've just read and about which we have just sung a few moments ago will be fulfilled literally and exactly like the Word of God declares it to be 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ was born physically into this world Isaiah the prophet spoke of his coming what Isaiah said so very long ago is very pertinent and very powerful this evening we've just read it I think that there are three major thoughts here in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 I'd like us to focus on those for just a few moments the first thought is what we might call the mystery of his humanity. The mystery of his humanity. Verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. How was that child born? How was the son given? Well, we know that from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. A virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The Gospel of Matthew, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, quotes that very verse in chapter 1, verse 23, but he adds the meaning of Emmanuel. Literally translated, that means God with us. But how did it come that God would come to be with us? Well, we've just read it a few moments ago. The Bible teaches that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born of a virgin. That's the mystery of his humanity. He was fully human but without the old Adamic nature marked by sin and yet also fully divine. He was as much a man as though he were not God at all and as much God as though he were not man at all. He was fully God and fully man. But how did it happen? I mean, what were the actual events where life was formed in Mary's womb? How did that happen? 
Well, only God actually knows the full answer to that. It was a miracle. In fact, Mary asked the same question, how will this be to me since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now you know from our previous Christmas messages that both Luke and Matthew speak about the Holy Spirit's role in the conception. That is what guaranteed, that is what absolutely ensured that our Lord Jesus Christ would be born without a sinful nature. When the embryo grew to fetal form and then on to term, there was just a natural process exactly like ours to the birth, again guaranteeing that he is truly human. One theologian writes, from the production of the egg in Mary's ovary to the actual birth, the fetal state in Mary's womb was entirely under the controlling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And under such superintendence, there was perfect protection from any impulse of sin." Unquote. Now I've had people ask me the question, do you really believe that? I can remember all the way back in high school, all the way back in college, when I was working as the host captain at the Sermons from Science Pavilion at Hemisphere in 1968 in San Antonio, Texas, responsible for about 140 young people, having people challenge me with that question and other questions very much like it. Do you really believe that? I mean, after all, in this age of empirical scientific evidence, do you really believe in the virgin birth? I remember one Jewish young man who heard me talking outside the pavilion over a microphone, and he sat and listened for a long time, drinking his beer at the Lone Star Beer Pavilion directly across the alleyway where our pavilion, the Alive Pavilion, we showed the Moody Institute from Science Films. He was over there drinking his beer, and he just sat and listened to me, and I noticed him after a while, and finally he came over and began to ask me questions. I had the privilege of witnessing to that young man. He was a Jewish young man, a student at Johns Hopkins University all summer long because he worked on the river crew that ran the gondolas up and down the San Antonio River. So I had many opportunities to speak with him of Christ, how Jesus was his Messiah. And just couldn't believe it. Do you really mean that you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? <laughs> After all, he was a science major. He could hardly understand that I would believe in something like that in light of science. My answer is yes, I do absolutely believe in the virgin birth. In fact, it always amazes me, not merely at people who are into the sciences, but it amazes me when there are theologians who don't believe in the virgin birth. Those who want to argue against the virgin birth as a non-essential doctrine have some very problematic troubles that they're going to have to face. Even though only two of the gospel writers refer to it, it's strongly implied in the other two. Let me tell you how important the virgin birth is. First, if you dismiss it as a fable or as a myth or as some kind of a later church add-on that was added in the Middle Ages by mysterious monks, you're going to have some problems with the veracity, the truthfulness of the Word of God. Because the Bible teaches very clearly and plainly and unmistakably and unshakably that Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit and he was born of a literal virgin. The Greek word parthenos that is used there in Matthew chapter 123 is the word for a literal, technical, absolute, no immorality at all involved virgin. Yes, that's what the Bible teaches. If you say that Jesus was not born of a virgin, you have just said something very strong about the word of God. You have just declared that the word of God is untrue. 
You're not only going to have problems with the character of the Word of God, but you're going to have problems and trouble with the character of Mary. If Jesus Christ was not virgin born, Mary is little more than a harlot and a liar. And worse than that, God's character is then called into question because his angel Gabriel said that she was favored of God. Not only will you have difficulty with the character of the Bible, the character of Mary, and the character of God, you're especially going to have difficulty with the character of Jesus Christ himself. You see, if Jesus was not conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, then not only was he born of an illicit sexual union, but he was a child of Adam, a sinner like the rest of us. And the Bible says in Romans 5.12, Therefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So you see, if that's true, that Jesus was a sinner like everybody else, and that he was not the spotless, sinless Son of God, therefore he could not offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Don't ever say that the virgin birth is not important. In fact, if you stop and think about it, your faith in who Jesus is and what he did stands or falls on the basis of the virgin birth. If Jesus is not sinless, he's not a pure savior. Then he is a sinful, impure savior, and therefore he is no savior at all. But thank God that the Bible says he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Because he was sinless, he could bear our sins. And thus, as God the Father looked at him, this infinite Son of God, bearing the sins of the world, in his own body on Calvary's cross, as the scripture tells us, he could bear our infinite sins in his infinite nature as God and die in our place. If he was only a sinful man, he could never do that for you or for me. If you take away the virgin birth, you take away your hope of heaven. If there is no miraculous conception, if there is no virgin birth, there is no deity. If there is no deity, there is no sinless nature. If there is no sinless nature, there is no substitutionary death. He couldn't have died for your sins if he were a sinner. He would have had to have died for his own sins. No virgin birth, no deity. No deity, no sinless nature. No sinless nature, no substitutionary atonement for sin. No atonement for sin, no new birth. No new birth, no hope of heaven. The only thing that remains is the judgment of God and the horror of hell. It's just like the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the resurrection. If the resurrection is not true, we who believe in the virgin birth are of all men most miserable. But if it is true, and it is true, then we have a Savior. And his name is Jesus. Let me give you that little quote I was talking about a little earlier. He came as he did to be what he was, sinless. He was what he was to do, what he did, die for us. He did what he did that we might be who we are, redeemed sinners. He was born of a virgin that I might be born again. He became a son of man that I might become a son of God. He came to earth that I might go to heaven Unto us a child is born. That's his humanity. 
But that's not all that's there in those verses in Isaiah. Look at verse 6 again. Unto us a son is given. I mentioned this in passing this morning. That speaks of his deity. That speaks of his pre-existence. It's stated explicitly in our text. Jesus was not the result just of a miraculous conception and birth. He was not just a man who was born sinless and who lived a sinless life and who died as a sinless and therefore acceptable sacrifice. Jesus was and is the eternal Son of God. Unto us a Son is given. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That indescribable gift, as Paul says of Jesus, it's an indescribable gift. It's a matchless gift. You can't describe it in words when you consider the gift. Deity wrapped in humanity. In other words, the Lord Jesus is the only earthly child of the Heavenly Father, but he was also the heavenly child of an earthly mother. Fully man, a child is born, yet fully divine, a son is given. So when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, don't just think about the miraculous conception in Mary's womb as the beginning. Don't just think of his birth in Bethlehem as the starting point. You have to go back to eternity past, and you find that there never was a time when Jesus was not. We read that this evening in John chapter 1, in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Back to our text there in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 again. It says, The government will be upon his shoulders. This child that is born, the son that is given, is sovereign. He is a ruler. Dear people, don't you look forward to the day when the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling here on earth in charge in such a way that there will be no toleration of sin when he is the one <laughs> not somebody else when he is the one issuing executive orders verse 7 you know the old song says Jesus shall reign from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more he came the first time because of the prophecies and just as surely as Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled concerning the virgin birth, Isaiah's prophecy concerning his rule and reign on the throne of David is going to come true, literally and exactly. Same book, both of them found together in the same passages, neither of them allegorical. They are literal and precise because God is communicating his truth to us in language that we can understand. Think about that for a few moments. You can count on it. He's coming again. He came the first time and fulfilled part of his prophecies, but he came coming again to fulfill the rest of it. When he came the first time, he came to a feeding trough. When he comes again, he's coming to a fabulous throne. When he came the first time, he stood before Pilate to be judged. When he comes again, Pilate will stand before him to be judged. When he came the first time, he came to a crucifixion. When he comes again, it will be to a coronation. When he came the first time, he came to suffer. When he comes again, he will come in splendor. When he came the first time, he came to redeem. When he comes again, he's coming to reign. He's coming this time not as a little baby, but as a mighty monarch and a great king. Isaiah said, yes, he said, a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he's going to rule and he's going to reign as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation chapter 19. That passage we read just a moment ago in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 also says some other things about Jesus. It tells us about his person. Isaiah is not only speaking about the mystery of his humanity and the majesty of his deity, but he speaks about the magnificence of his person. The next word that is used, the next two words that are used to describe him, he's wonderful. He's counselor. 
When the Bible calls him wonderful, he's clearly wonderful in his birth. He's wonderful in his life. He's wonderful in his words. He's wonderful in his works. He's wonderful in his death. He's wonderful in his resurrection. He's wonderful in his ascension. He will be wonderful in his coming again. His name is indeed wonderful. He's not only wonderful, but he's wise. Look at it again. His name should be called Wonderful Counselor. There is wisdom in his name. Let me give you some other things that I lifted. Founding Father Samuel Adams wrote, quote, Revelation assures us that righteousness exalteth a nation. Communities are dealt with in this world by the wise and just ruler of the universe. He rewards or punishes them as nations according to their general character. Yes, he is a wonderful counselor whom we would do well to take heed. But the world has rejected his wisdom. They, don't, they say, we don't need him as a counselor. We're the ones who are wise. You know, if you look back across the ages of human history, what you'll see is what ruin and rebellion man's so-called wisdom has brought to us. If man is so smart, if man is so wise, tell me why we allow a bunch of black-robed bullies on the Supreme Court to overturn the will of multiplied thousands. Tell me why we celebrate what God calls an abomination. Tell me why we kill thousands of babies in the womb every day. It's as the Bible says in Romans 121, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And again, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Christ, the counselor that this world needs. How great to have him living in our hearts to give us wisdom and direction and counsel. But not only is he the wonderful, not only is he the counselor, he is also called El Gibor, the mighty God. I had a very interesting conversation with some Jewish men when I was working as a the host at a radio station. I worked on a radio station about 30 hours a week while I was going through seminary. Worked every night, and on Saturday I worked a 12-hour shift playing the music that I love to hear, most favorite music, all these classical pieces. It was a big radio station about two miles from Dallas Seminary where I was li it's living at the dorm at that time. And the one evening, some friends of one of the other disc jockeys, or one of the other radio announcers, uh, came down. And they were sitting around and we were talking and some beautiful music playing in the background. I sort of had to keep an eye on the turntable. They didn't have uh, all these fancy things we have today like CDs and so on. It was a record that you put a little arm down with a little point with a diamond on the end of it and you had to play the records. So I had to keep an eye on that to make sure that everything was going fine. But we were having a conversation and they were challenging me about who Jesus was. And I quoted this passage. It says that he is the mighty God. And one of the Jewish fellows sat there and crossed his arm. He's a businessman. Crossed his arms and looked at me and said, Oh, so tell me what the Hebrew is. I said, El Gibor. God, the mighty one. God, the hero. A Gibor is a hero, a mighty hero. You know what to do with that. That's a passage dealing with the Messiah. You see, we, we serve the God who created the heavens and the earth. He weighs the mountains in a scale and the hills in a balance. He holds the seven seas in the palm of his hands. The Bible speaks of the Lord Jesus and says that all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1 verse 3, we read it a few moments ago. That baby in the manger, that child in Mary's arms, is El Gibor! the mighty God. Jesus made it all. Every sun, every star, every planet, every continent, every ocean, every drop of water, every blade of grass in this whole universe, Jesus made it all. Jesus said that all power in heaven and earth are his. 
He's the God who divided the sea from Moses. He's the God who brought down the walls for Joshua. He's the God who delivered Goliath into the hands of David and the Hebrew children from the fiery furnace and Daniel out of the lion's den. In human flesh, that same God commanded the winds and the waves on the Sea of Galilee. He fed the hungry when he fed the 4,000 and the 5,000. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. And he is the God to whom George Washington prayed and then who gave him victory over our oppressors. He's the God who with a mighty hand 200 years ago doused the flames and drove the British invaders from our land. He's the God who enabled us to prevail against Hitler's last gasp in the Battle of the Bulge 70 years ago, giving us good weather for our bombers at just the right time and in response to a chaplain's prayer. The mighty God has shown himself strong on behalf of America. You might say that was then and this is now. Back to Brother Kenyon, Kirk, uh, Cura. We're facing two more years of an imperial president who has little rule for the rule of little regard for the rule of law. How can we prevail over that? Well, I like what the Founding Father John Jay said right before Christmas in 1776. And it's a good word for us going into the new year. Quote, Unite in preparing for a vigorous defense of your country as if all depended on your own exertions. And when you've done all things that you can do, then rely upon the good providence of Almighty God for success in full confidence that without His blessing, all our efforts will inevitably fail." Unquote. He's not only a wonderful counselor, he's also a mighty God. And another quote that Brother Kenyon gives to us here, George Washington said, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And that's not only true of nations, but also of individuals. So do you face some impossible circumstances? Turn to the mighty God, for there is nothing impossible with him. Are you over your head in your place of service? The Apostle Paul said, faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. We need to learn to rest in the strength of Almighty God. Isaiah 7, or 9, verse 7 also tells us something else about him. He's the everlasting father. He's called everlasting father. When you think of a father, what do you think of? If you think of a biblical father, you think of a biblical father's love. You think of his sacrifice. You think of his willingness to spend and be spent for those whom he loves. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The Bible calls God the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, Whosoever has seen me has seen the Father. John 14, 9. Jesus is a visible manifestation of every character quality that the Father has. So the love that dwells in the bosom of the Father is the love that is displayed in the life of God the Son. Have you ever felt unloved? Have you ever felt lonely? I think the answer is yes for all of us. Have you ever felt that way at a Christmas season? You know, for some people, Christmas is the loneliest, most depressing time of the year. Isn't that sad? Because, you see, everybody's told that they're supposed to be happy, and they look around and they're not happy. They realize that all the tinsel and trinkets and toys in the world can't possibly make them happy. All the gifts, all the glitter, all over the world can't make up for one 
that you loved or that you lost. But remember, there is somebody who does love you. There is somebody who does care about you. There's someone who wants to wrap you in his arms and draw you close. The everlasting Father. And finally, he's called the Prince of Peace. You know, I think everybody wants peace. Everybody wants one of those moments when the phone doesn't ring and the dog isn't barking, where the kids aren't screaming and where people aren't demanding something. A moment that you can just have some peace. Well, I tell you, when our kids were growing up, both Judy and I felt that way many times. Just for a little bit of peace. Did you know that everywhere Jesus is Lord, there is peace? That everywhere Jesus is not recognized as Lord, there is no peace? Jesus is Lord in heaven, and so there is peace in heaven. If Jesus is Lord in your heart, there's peace in your heart. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified with, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's talking about peace with God, but there's also the peace of God. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Oh, what peace you can know when the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ, reigns in your heart. Do you have that peace today? Not all the money, not all the popularity, not all the accolades, nor the accomplishments of this world can give you peace. No person can give you peace except Jesus. And where Jesus is Lord, there is peace. This passage describes not only the humanity of Christ, not only the deity of Christ, but it gives us the beautiful picture of the person of Christ, who Jesus is, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's all wrapped up in Jesus. And that's whom we celebrate at this Christmas time. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. God come in the flesh, the one who came so that he might die for us. And if he is not virgin born, then he's not sinless. If he's not sinless, he can't die for our sins. If he can't die for our sins, he's not our Savior. And without that, we have no hope of heaven. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow in humble adoration and thanksgiving that he came for us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude our worship tonight by turning in our celebration hymnals to hymn 291. Oh, sing.